The ancient Enuma Elish tablets tell a story about our young species, created by the Anunnaki to serve as a slave race to mine gold. However, through their genetic experiments, the Anunnaku named Enki created a new kind of human, capable of reproducing and thinking for ourselves. This created a paradigm shift, and we left the Anunnaki settlements. For us, everything changed, and we were set on a new path of self-discovery. Where did we go from here? The mystery is about to be revealed. When discussing the story of the history of humanity, this is the part where there's a bit of a break in the chain, making it very difficult to discern the truth. Keep this in mind for this chapter specifically, because the ancient accounts are very fragmented and their meanings are not always agreed upon. You see, most stories in the Sumerian tablets document the creation of humanity and then usually are fragmented until the story of the flood. The flood is a huge discussion of its own and one that we're going to be exploring very soon. However, there is a big mystery of what happened in the middle. In order to make sense of it, we have to look to a few different sources. It's definitely one of those subjects that I really encourage keeping an open mind about because there are several different key versions and stories about what happened, from James Churchward's account of Mu, to the Book of Enoch, to Plato's account of Atlantis, which may have even come from ancient Egypt. Along with that, we will also touch upon the Emerald Tablets of Thoth and other myths and legends from around the world, and of course, Drumvalo's account from his books, The Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life, which as we mentioned before, did an amazing job of putting a complete story together only a few decades ago. According to Drumvalo's version, from the time of Adam and Eve, our race developed in two strains, one that could live free from enslavement, although they were still monitored, and the others that were destined for a life of slavery. After the first humans were born, they moved away from Eden to another part of Africa or Eurasia, where they were allowed to grow and develop their consciousness. Eventually, there was a consciousness shift and these early humans migrated to a place that was very isolated from the rest of the world. The place that we moved to was called Mu, though commonly today, it's known by the name Lemuria. When you begin to research Lemuria, you find some interesting things. The original theory for Lemuria was that it actually was an island or a stretch of islands located in the Indian Ocean, connecting Madagascar to India. The name Lemuria actually came about from a 19th century controversy over Darwin's origin of species. Defenders of his theory had trouble explaining how a certain species, specifically lemurs, became distributed in Madagascar and India, but not in Africa or the Middle East, connecting the land masses. It became suggested that at one point, a land bridge existed in the Indian Ocean, which they named after the lemurs they were studying. Thus the name Lemuria came to be. The concept of Lemuria was quite popular for a while, before losing relevance due to the evolution of continental drift theory, where the continents existed together as Pangaea. The name Lemuria was then later applied in modern spiritual circles to the legends of Mu, which is sometimes also called Pacifica. Anyway, so what is Mu? Well, the legend of Mu first began in the writings of Augustus Le Plongion, after his investigations of the Mayan ruins in the Yucatan. His work with translating parts of the Popol Vuh led him to believe that Mu was associated with the lost continent of Atlantis and wrote about it as such. However, Mu as a lost continent in the Pacific began with a man named James Churchward, who met with Plongion and his wife in 1885 after their 12 year excursion in the Yucatan. The hypotheses are featured in a series of books written by Churchward between 1926 and 1933. He claimed that when he was a young man serving as a soldier in India, a high ranking temple priest showed him an ancient set of clay tablets that only two others could read. James said that he convinced the priest to teach him the ancient language and that upon reading them, he learned that they came from a place where man first appeared, Mu. 
James gave a vivid account of an ancient advanced civilization, the Nikals, who flourished sometime between 50,000 and 12,000 years ago. Mu was said to have 64 million inhabitants and seven major cities with colonies established throughout the other continents. The entire population was separated into 10 tribes and followed one government and one spirituality. He said that the continent was located in the Pacific Ocean and was 5,000 miles east to west and 3,000 miles from north to south. He also stated that it had massive plains, vast rivers, rolling hills, large bays and estuaries, and that eventually it was obliterated in almost a single night after a series of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. After Mu sank, its inhabitants would become the founders of the great civilizations of Egypt, Central America, India, and others, and was the source of the world's ancient megalithic architecture. According to James, the king of Mu was named Ra, and he said this was related to the Egyptian god Ra, as well as the Rapa Nui word for the sun, Ra'a. Looking to the Bible, James also made a note that Moses had trained by the Nikal Brotherhood in Egypt, and he believed that the Assyrians mistranslated the Garden of Eden story, suggesting that it should have been in the Pacific Ocean. Today, most archeologists insist that the legends of Mu are pure pseudo-archeology, span end of story. But what I find interesting about this is that at the very least, there's some evidence that appears to support the idea. Let's begin with the geography. Now, the legends of Mu suggest that it was a massive continent in the Pacific Ocean. And there are a few accounts as to what this place looked like. While James suggested it was a long continent with rolling hills and many rivers, Drumfellow's account in the Flower of Life book suggested it was not a single island, but a stretch of islands of varying sizes, a massive archipelago ranging from the area around Hawaii through Polynesia and all the way to Easter Island. In floor maps of the Pacific Ocean, you can see this stretch of mountainous bodies underwater, which could have had both massive islands as well as supporting many little islands as well, were it at the surface of the ocean. There are several other ancient discoveries which could potentially be physical evidence of Mu, from Japan's underwater site at Yonaguni to the cryptic petroglyphs on Hawaii. And that's not to mention Easter Island. We know today that many of the remarkable features of Easter Island, such as the legendary Easter Island heads, which were recently discovered to have traces of full bodies, were only built in the last thousand years. But Easter Island also has an ancient written text in a language called Rongo Rongo, although it's unclear as to whether or not this is writing or proto-writing. If it is in fact a full writing system, it could be one of the only surviving cases of an independent invention of an alphabet ever in history. These surviving tablets are a huge mystery for us today, as the language has still not been deciphered. When we put these findings together, it seems to indicate higher levels of advancement in ancient cultures than we currently understand, which is made even more interesting because of the remote location seemingly in the middle of nowhere. Looking to the Rapa Nui people of Easter Island, we actually find a similar story to the legends of Mu. In one of their creation myths, we find a story of a great and beautiful continent that they called Hiva. One night, the king of Hiva received a message in a dream that his land would sink. And sure enough, this vision came to pass. Thanks to the king and his dream, however, the people were guided to a new land, which was Easter Island. And there they survived the disappearance of their homeland. Historical and scientific investigations on the people of Easter Island suggest that Polynesians from the Marquesas Islands traveled from the West to their new home. But the date is unknown with estimates for their arrival ranging anywhere between 300 to 1200 AD, perhaps even further back given the lack of evidence. This seems to show that the myth of Easter Island has more historical truth to it than mere fable. They did in fact migrate to Easter Island and one wonders what other parts of the myth may also prove to be true. Stepping back to the history of the people of Mu, in the ancient secret of the flower of life, Drumfalo described that the descendants of Adam and Eve were taken by Enki to Mu although he used the name Lemuria, so that they could safely grow and develop their consciousness on their own without interference from the slave miners or the Anunnaki who were still mining Africa for its gold and inhabiting their cities and temples across the Middle East. There are a few different theories regarding the timeline of Mu. Some theories place Mu's existence from about 75,000 years ago to 30,000 years ago. And it was at that time that it sank and Atlantis rose. Others believe that Lemuria and Atlantis existed at the same time, which is what we find in James Churchward's version of the story. In Drumvalo's telling, on Mu, 
humans evolved to a very high level of consciousness where we became capable of doing things that would seem almost impossible to us today. Supposedly, we experienced a reality where matter was less dense and more permeable to our thoughts and feelings. And so we were able to levitate, move through solid objects and other amazing feats. In a way, we were kind of like young deities. He also wrote that on this continent, the first mystery school was created. It was founded by two people who discovered the gift of immortality, who then taught this ability to approximately a thousand others before the time came when Mu sank. This event is described as a terrifying cataclysm, which we find two predominant versions for depending on the timeline. James Churchward suggested that the main mineral of the landmass of Mu was granite and was honeycombed with huge shallow chambers and cavities filled with explosive gases. And due to volcanic activity underneath the continent, it released tremendous explosions causing the continent to sink. As with most legends of a lost civilization, the stories all describe that Mu or Lemuria, for one reason or another, sank beneath the waves, leaving no remnant of it behind. And the survivors made their way to new homes. And one common theory about where they went was a new continent called Atlantis. Sort of a fun side note here. Do you remember way back in the original human history movie where we started by saying, well, this? This story spans back hundreds of thousands of years into our past. It talks about Tiamat and Nibiru, the Nephilim, seeding the human race, Adam and Eve, and the children of Lemuria. This portion of the story is really interesting, but not the most crucial to know. We're not going to be covering this at this time. We are, however, going to be picking up the story at the end of Lemuria and discussing the events of Atlantis up to present day. Well, guess what? We're here. I'm so happy to at long last bring some context to the beginning of that particular story. However, there's still more to cover that we previously hadn't. And for those who haven't seen the original human history movie yet, we'll make sure to cover the basics as well so that you won't be left out. Though, you can always go watch that one right after this is done. It was at this point that another mass migration occurred where the children of Mu found a new home and they called it Atlantis. So Atlantis, the best place to start here is with the origins of this myth. The first account of Atlantis actually came from Plato in his writings called Timaeus and Critias from about 360 BC. He discussed an ancient kingdom called Atlantis located on an island in the Atlantic Ocean, somewhere beyond the pillars of Hercules in the modern day Straits of Gibraltar. Today, the modern consensus around the story is that Atlantis is purely fictitious, a parable used for educational purposes or to glorify Athens in the eyes of Plato. And while most people believe this, there are those who suggest otherwise. It's rather interesting that Plato, who is the earliest surviving source for the story of Atlantis, uh, tells us that he got it from his uh, relative Solon, who in turn got it from the ancient Egyptians and that they spoke of a time 9,000 years before the time of Solon. That's 9,600 BC or 11,600 years before the present. Academics think that Plato made it all up, but if Plato made it all up, it's extraordinary that he chose that date and that time around 12,000 years ago, because that was absolutely at the peak of the meltdown of the last ice age when there was indeed global flooding. The story of Atlantis tells the tale of a maturing humanity who had developed a civilization on a large island often believed to be in the Atlantic Ocean. In the Flower of Life books, Drumvalo shares this image of Atlantis, a rough generalization of what it might've looked like. We also find this diagram inside the book of the Emerald Tablets, of which we'll be looking at shortly. But with that said, it's been widely theorized that if there is an ancient lost civilization, it's most likely hidden somewhere under the ice in Antarctica. In a Nova special called Antarctica, Secrets Beneath the Ice, geologists discover multiple places in Antarctica which had the remains of old mosses and plant tissues in what they described as pristine condition from a time when Antarctica was still warm and abundant with life. There are even pieces of trees that have been found, all of which have been preserved under permafrost rather than becoming fossilized. The geologists in this video describe that the bits of nature are not from millions of years ago, but relatively recent history. This is a landmark and paradigm shattering discovery because even today, if you do some research, you'll find that the general consensus is that Antarctica was last ice-free 3.5 million years ago. And the remnants that were just discovered there prove that number wrong entirely. This dramatically changes our perspective of the history of our world. 
fragments of nature are found under a layer of volcanic ash, suggesting that a huge volcano or cataclysm of some kind, maybe a comet hitting the earth, caused a dramatic shift that we're now seeing the remnants of today. Further, I'd like to take a moment to discuss with you the legendary Piri Reis map, an old map drawn by Admiral and cartographer Piri Reis in Constantinople in 1513, which describes with remarkable geographical detail the seismic profile of certain portions of Antarctica. Reis used information gathered from many explorers at the time, but what's amazing about this map is that Reis could not have acquired his information about Antarctica from any contemporary explorers because this continent remained undiscovered until nearly 300 years after the map was drawn. But what's perhaps even more anomalous about this whole thing is that the map depicts what Antarctica looks like under ice-free conditions. The last time that that area would have been free of ice would have been at least 6,000 BC, which was a whole millennium before the Sumerian civilization really began to emerge into the culture we know today. A note on the southernmost section of the map reads, and in this country, it seems that there are white haired monsters in this shape and also six horned oxen. The Portuguese infidels have written it in their maps. Interestingly, the Portuguese provided information on this southernmost region in Reese's map, according to the notes on it. Now, Piri Reese himself left notes that his map was drawn from pre-existing information and maps. However, he himself did not venture any suggestions as to the identity of the cartographers who produced these earlier maps. In 1963, however, Professor Hapgood proposed a novel and thought-provoking solution to the problem. He argued that some of the source maps the Admiral had made use of, in particular the ones that were said to date back to the fourth century BC, had themselves been based on even older sources, which in turn had been based on sources originating in the furthest of antiquity. There was, he asserted, irrefutable evidence that the earth had been comprehensively mapped before 4000 BC by a hitherto unknown and undiscovered civilization, which had achieved a high level of technological advancement. The Piri Reis anomaly and the mysteries of Antarctica are described with significant detail in Graham Hancock's book, Fingerprints of the Gods, and we highly recommend giving it a read, along with his follow-up book, Magicians of the Gods. Now, before we move on, there's just a few more interesting things that I have to share with you about Antarctica. The first is a particularly curious accidental leak of information that supports this idea that something is going on down there. And it actually comes from Fitbit. You see, recently Fitbit published a world heat map with Strava to show where people are commonly wearing their Fitbits. Now, I suppose most people do not disable their location services because this published map at first showed a number of curious formations under the ice in Antarctica, including a large ring and some other underground bases. Since this was initially published, the government or whoever has forced Fitbit to remove these images from their public heat map, but you can still find a few YouTube videos of people pointing them out. Well, hey, like this one. Finally, in the last several years, photos that were taken using Google Earth were publicized, causing more than a few heads to turn. Here is one that shows a rather curious formation that is clearly not natural to the environment. And here is one that looks more than a little bit like a pyramid. Many were quick to suggest that this was a remnant of some Atlantean civilization, but many critics were quick to put forth that it was just a four-sided mountain and that pyramid-shaped peaks are very common, such as the Matterhorn in the Alps and Mount Bullenstinder in Iceland as notable examples. And while there's no question that these are mighty mountains, this one in Antarctica is significantly cleaner. There's just no comparison really. It's much less rigid than any of the examples the skeptics give to try and debunk it. But look, it might just be a convenient mountain. We don't claim to know either way, but it's interesting to look at and ponder, wouldn't you agree? Now let's return to the story because there are several more accounts of Atlantis that we have to consider. One is the original story we first shared in the Hidden Human History movie regarding the Martians and the fall of consciousness. Then we have another version that comes from the Book of Enoch, an ancient text that accounts for some specific events that took place before the flood as well. We also see the Emerald Tablets and what is written there about the fall of Atlantis. Because we've already made a movie about the Atlantis Martian story, we'll just cover it briefly here. And for the sake of the story and the visualization of it, for now, we're just going to show Atlantis as we have so far, as a continent of its own. But keep in mind that this is kind of a placeholder as Atlantis is a great mystery. 
Even the name Atlantis comes from later writings about this land. And if we were to go back in time and discover that it was real, it most likely was not called Atlantis in their own language. Who knows, did the continent really sink? Was it Antarctica? Maybe instead of sinking, it flooded over and then froze underneath miles of ice. Or did it simply never exist at all? Well, if it did, here's a breakdown of one of the more popular stories about the legends of Atlantis. Essentially, the Atlanteans were more mature and evolved since their time on Mu and were very connected with each other and nature. But things changed dramatically for the Atlanteans when a different species from another world came to our planet. The story suggests that they were beings from Mars who were said to be responsible for destroying the atmosphere on the planet, causing it to become the red lifeless rock that we know it to be today. These beings had taken a path of separation in the evolution of their species, a path called the Lucifer experiment, which involves disconnecting themselves from each other and nature and having no inner love or compassion whatsoever. The story says that these Martians made a home for themselves on Atlantis and slowly began to affect the consciousness of the Atlanteans by introducing their technologies and affecting the way that the Atlanteans perceived reality. As a result, the Atlanteans began to become more disconnected from nature and each other, which allowed the Martians to easily take over. Eventually, a comet was said to have hit the planet right in the area where the Martians' home was on Atlantis. The Martians were furious, and so they built a technology called a synthetic Merkaba and they were going to use it to get revenge. This technology, however, did not work properly and emitted a shockwave of energy on their home and ultimately created a dimensional tear. This caused a tremendous catastrophe for all of the life on Atlantis and the beings living there became very sick with consciousness and energy from other dimensions being pulled into their world. The result of this was a huge fall in consciousness, which coincided with a global pole shift, a geomagnetic reversal a massive shift took place. Save for a few spiritual masters, all of humanity fell to a lower state of consciousness, as low as you can go and still survive. In the process of this, their memories were erased, just as a magnet can wipe the information on a hard drive. Now this may seem far-fetched, but it isn't impossible. One particular study provides good evidence that humans can perceive the magnetic field around them even as weak as the Earth's itself. A follow-up study found that the mechanism behind this are magnetized particles in the brain. Researchers concluded that for such an ability to exist, it must have had some evolutionary purpose. Interestingly, some studies have even indicated that two major geomagnetic shifts may have had an impact, not only on our evolution in the past, but also had a role in extinction events ranging from the early Quaternary period to the early Holocene. This study found that a large global geomagnetic reversal event called the Lachamp event 44,000 years ago and another unnamed event 13,000 years ago both coincided with mammal extinctions, which were impacted by a weakening of the Earth's magnetic field leading to higher ultraviolet radiation. This may not only coincide with the sinking of Atlantis, but also the theorized timeline of the sinking of Mu. Further, by comparing branches in the human family tree and linking them with the magnetic field information found in sediments and archaeomagnetic data, they found that there was possibly a long-term role for ultraviolet radiation and the magnetic field in human evolution. That said, the concept of memory erasure could have various meanings. In one sense, it could be a global magnetic effect wiping human memories, but it could also relate to the destruction of all of our technology and most of civilization and being reduced to a level of consciousness where we had to start over technologically from scratch with no records and very little evidence of any ancient civilization. This entire story is said to have happened 13,000 years ago, at the point when Earth went through a huge shift pertaining to its polar ice caps, when a massive amount of ice sheets began to melt, flooding the world with water and potentially helping to usher in the Holocene, the epoch of time we are in today, after the end of the last ice age. After this shift, small pockets of humans slowly began to develop and discover life all over again from square one and the few spiritual masters who kept their memories began to support us as we became capable of comprehending their stories. They may have tried to explain the history of the world, but the fallen humans couldn't comprehend it. And so the stories were masked in the legends of the gods so that humanity could come to make sense of who they were and where they came from. These quote unquote gods seeded civilizations around the world from ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt to India and all the way to the Olmecs in Mesoamerica. Of course, it may be more logical to presume that it was Enki or the other Anunnaki who helped seed civilization once more 
at least in ancient Sumer, or perhaps a combination of the two. Ultimately, this is the point at which a lot of this entire story would have been passed down to the Sumerians. Earlier on, we explored the possibility that the stories of the gods were an encoded message handed down to the Sumerians and Babylonians by these beings who had a much higher understanding than the early humans did. If this story is true, then this is how the Sumerians would have come to have knowledge of the origins of the solar system from previous higher beings who shared it with them. But is it truly possible that this is how it all happened? Now in this story, it was said that the goal for us as a species was to return to our original higher consciousness in as short of a time as possible. And the time that was forecasted for us to finally begin remembering who we are and what our place in the cosmos is, is this point in time right now, which is why this conversation is more important than ever. For it would seem as though we are at a huge turning point for our species and actively shifting into a higher consciousness more and more each day. Interestingly, this shift in energy is currently being mirrored by the Schumann resonance in our Earth's magnetic fields. The electromagnetic resonance being generated by lightning discharge in a part of the upper atmosphere known as the ionosphere has been increasing recently to coincide with our frequency shift. This means that our magnetic field is actually changing to coincide with our evolution, which I find just to be amazing. This is a very exciting time in our evolution as with research teams like the Global Coherence Initiative and HeartMath, some very interesting research is being done on the interconnection between humanity and Earth's magnetic fields and energetic systems, giving us insights into our own frequency changes as and when they happen. Anyway, back to Atlantis. As I was saying, there's a few other versions of how the story could have transpired. We're going to now briefly look at these other two accounts of Atlantis from ancient times. First, let us begin with the Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean. These are said to be 12 ancient tablets which are under the care of a secret society in Egypt who have vowed to protect the sacred wisdom inscribed upon them. The tablets are said to have been written by Thoth who presided on Atlantis before the fall and whose Atlantean name was Chikatet Arlek Vomalites. The tablets were supposedly translated by a man named Dr. Doriel. Of course, these tablets are believed by many to be a hoax for no modern picture of them actually exists and they're not on display in any museum. Critics of this work point out that Doriel seemed to write these tablets based on the occult theosophist society and other spiritual teachings and channelings, along with a few ideas thrown in found within H.P. Lovecraft stories. And those connections do seem to be valid. Yet, even if the tablets themselves are not truly authentic, it would seem as though they are predominantly based upon a number of wisdom teachings. Doriel also provided a rich account of Atlantean culture, which could have been channeled, but of course, it's unclear if any of it is grounded in truth. For myself, I found a great deal of inspiration and wisdom by reading these passages, and they can be excellent tools for exploring the inner mysteries and contemplating the universe. Spirit Mysteries recently published a new edition of the Emerald Tablets, made to be easily legible to the modern reader, for the original publication is like, hark now and hear ye, and thou thine own inner flame shall be lit. It can be a bit hard to follow, so you'll find links in the comments to go and get a free download today. The Emerald Tablets describe a number of different things from wisdom teachings to ancient history. In a nutshell, Thoth describes the beauty and majesty of Atlantis, a bright and vibrant home for the people who lived there. He goes on to describe the degeneration of the hearts of the Atlanteans, which led to their downfall and the great cataclysm. He said that Atlantis fell because there were those who were too proud of their knowledge and dared to enter the halls of Amenti in order to get greater knowledge, kind of a lust for power moment that created the cataclysm. This could be referring to the Martians building the synthetic Merkaba with forbidden powers. He also said that the few who survived did so by using a spaceship, which today is buried beneath the Sphinx. This is a concept we explored much more thoroughly in the original human history movie. Throughout the Emerald Tablets, he also describes a great deal of wisdom, which we can use to evolve our consciousness. We highly recommend you go and read these passages for yourself if you haven't. For now though, let's stay on the subject of history because we have one more account of this pre-flood period of time to look at. Now, the Book of Enoch is one of the most ancient religious texts we have available to us today, with influence extending into the New Testament, even despite it not being considered biblical canon. The text appears to date back to about 300 to 200 BCE, so we must establish that it is younger than the Sumerian texts. The Book of Enoch describes a story from the perspective of Enoch, who was the great grandfather of Noah, who lived for 365 years up until the great flood wiped out most of humanity. The story details accounts of the Nephilim and the Watchers. As we previously discussed, 
the Nephilim are described as the children of the Anunnaki and human women together. Since the Book of Enoch describes that the Nephilim were the offspring of the Watchers and human women, we can easily link the Watchers to being the same as the Anunnaki. It's for this reason the Book of Enoch is so valuable to us in deciphering our past, because it provides one of the few clear links between the ancient Sumerian tablets and the stories we find in the Bible today. But because this book concerns itself so heavily with the events of the Nephilim and the Anunnaki, or the Watchers, you can probably imagine why they decided to omit this from the biblical canon. Some believe that these giants may have been the reason for the Great Flood, as they were seen to be unnatural and harmful to the human race. In the Book of Enoch, it describes that these Nephilim, known also as giants, multiply in numbers and grow to the point that humanity can no longer provide enough resources for themselves. With food shortages, the giants then began consuming humans and other animals. The Book of Enoch also tells us that many of the watchers, such as Azazel specifically, were responsible for teaching humans the art of warfare and how to construct weapons and other harmful devices. And for the sake of correlation, this is also reflected in the Emerald Tablets speaking to the degeneration of the human consciousness. Now, the events of this book are rather long and we're not going to get into all the details right now, but the story essentially culminates in the Great Flood wiping out humanity with only a few surviving humans, which is where Noah and the Ark come in. As for Enoch himself, he is taken into heaven by God in a fiery chariot, which is believed in some circles to actually be describing a spaceship that took him away to live somewhere else, maybe on another planet. Now, as we bring this segment to a close, there is one more theory out there pertaining to our original story that I must share. According to Sitchin, you know how Marduk was related to a planet in the earlier stories? Well, in later Sumerian tellings, he also seems to act with very personal and human-like characteristics. And Sitchin believed that the name Marduk used to describe a planet in some texts was also used to describe a specific being, just like Enki. He believed that Marduk was stationed on Mars at one point, but came to earth to invoke his authority and rulership over the world. This may even correlate to the Martian theory we covered before. This might be just a fanciful long shot, but is it possible that all of these stories connect and Atlantis fell because the Martians were actually a specific group of Anunnaki led by Marduk who came to the earth and bred with human women, creating deformed people and caused certain groups of humans to pursue dark magic, effectively changing the evolution of humanity, leading to this great cataclysm and fall in consciousness. Could it be? Obviously, all of this is just an idea. We cannot say definitively heads or tails what happened, but the connections here are definitely fun to explore nonetheless. How about you? What do you think happened? Make sure to let us know in the comments of this video. Now, this story is not over yet. We still have at least one more massive anomaly we have to look at. The point in history when all of these stories line up with each other, the Great Flood. The legends of the Great Flood are found all around the world, from Mesopotamia to China, and even Mesoamerica. All of the stories describe a god or gods who created the flood in order to punish and wipe out humanity. But is there any truth to these stories? And did a Great Flood truly cause a mass extinction long into our ancient past? Find out next time on Spirit Science, The Great Flood.